uh, taking your time to join this uh, I, we would like not like to call it as a webinar, but would like to call it as a virtual discussion because I think we are all uh, now fed up with too many webinars happening. So I thought, let me not call it as a webinar, but let it be called as a virtual uh, discussion so that uh, we start discussing about this interesting topic of dry age. So actually, we are going through uh, two pandemics. I read uh, somewhere that uh, the first pandemic is the coronavirus and the second pandemic is stupidity. So we have lots of these uh, news coming in the WhatsApp about uh, different views on uh, the pandemic. And uh, so, uh, and even the economy, I read somewhere that the economy is so bad that even the hot cakes are not selling like hot cakes. So there is a huge uh, problem in the economy also. So uh, we wanted to have this webinar or the virtual discussion covering this interesting topic of dry eye. But uh, I didn't want it to be like the regular dry eye webinar uh, because there are too many uh, happening and lots of material available on dry eye on uh, YouTube and uh, the internet. So we don't have to know the uh, scientific uh, part of dry eye alone, but uh, maybe how do we actually incorporate the dry eye treatment into the practices? So uh, in India, you see uh, there are lots of these uh, bigger ophthalmic practices which get into good revenues because they implement all the latest treatment systems into their uh, practice. On the other hand, there are a lot of these smaller ophthalmic practices, I'll say around 6,000 or 7,000 of these smaller op ophthalmic practices, which are still dependent more on uh, the optical revenue and the cataract surgery revenue. But I, we also felt that the dry eye is something uh, interesting and uh, th there is a huge need uh, for uh, uh, treatments of dry eye to be provided even by smaller clinics. So that was the whole idea of this webinar. So. Uh, so the idea, basically we'll be talking about what is dry eye and a little bit of the basics of dry eye, which uh, Dr. Pooja Kamar uh, from Narayan Metralia will be covering. And then we wanted to have two practitioners, one from the bigger city, uh, Dr. Anaga from Mumbai. Uh, she will be covering about how she has adapted the latest dry eye treatments into her practice. And uh, Dr. Saurabh, who is from a uh, smaller city like a tire to town, uh, Sangli in Maharashtra. So he will be covering about how he has been offering these uh, treatments. And we will also have a, a small panel discussion uh, at the end. And I will be talking about uh, how we can actually incorporate it into the practice and what is the economic uh, implications and how do we make it more affordable for even a smaller practitioner to offer these treatments in his practice. Uh, we'll have question and answer session towards then. In the meantime, if you have any questions, you can type your questions and then once all the three speakers are completed, then uh, we will take these questions. And maybe towards then you can also come live and uh, get your questions answered. So uh, initially it's going to be like the regular webinar where there are going to be uh, discussions and uh, people uh, they will present and then we will take it into a discussion mode once the speakers complete the, the presentation. So I'd like to uh, invite uh, Dr. Pooja Kamar uh, from Naren Netralia. Uh, she's an excellent speaker and uh, I, I've actually listened to her TED talk and uh, very interesting. So it would be interesting to hear her talk uh, about, uh, she's done extensive work on dry eye and particularly incorporation of these new uh, treatments into the practice. So she will give the institutional perspective of uh, dry uh, and how she has been handling it uh, in her practice uh, over the last few months, particularly after the pandemic. Uh, over to you, Dr. Pooja. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sandil. Thank you so much. Uh, so I'll just... Uh, are my slides visible? So yeah, yeah, your slides are visible. You can go ahead. Yeah, so what I'm going to do today is I'm not going to talk about what basic dry eyes, how you uh, treat your basic dry eyes in your practice, but uh, I'm going to start like, you know, everything has changed in this COVID era and uh, like, you know, we are getting used to the new normal. 
going to be talking about how the mod how do we approach this modern day dry eye and how we can incorporate this newer therapeutics in our practice so that you know our patients are happy their visits are reduced in the hospital and uh, the dependency is on the drops has reduced and the compliance on the drops is much better or or even that uh, dry eye therapy uh, whatever whatever i'm going to be speaking here i don't have any financial interests i'm just going to be speaking Thinking about our experience, uh, about our experience with Dr. Shetty here. Um, so, and I will. So, what I'll be trying to do is, I'll be trying to cover a lot of basic stuff. I'll make, try and make it as simple as possible, so that the next speakers, when they talk, it's uh, much connected. So, what happens is, like you know, we have a like we know that the mevobian gland dysfunction is one of the leading cause of dry eyes. uh we do have a lot of treatments like lubricants hot compressions uh, like we have our te tetracyclines chloramphenicol ointments we have our steroids also but however when we do this some patients don't respond to our conventional treatment and even if they respond they their compliance is not good or you know they don't want to put drops for a longer time multiple problems like you know multiple problems and nowadays like you know we have to see the multi like you know clinics uh they can't go out there a lot of them are elderly patients they want quick relief reduced visits to your hospitals and all that so what do we do in this things you know our like today's era everything is different like you know now covid is also coming uh and so our dry eye classification has changed nowadays it's not just you know complaints of dry eyes you have patients come with pain without stain your tear film metrics are normal but patients have a lot of discomfort uh they have hyperalgesia they have uh, burning sensation itching which is not explainable with your tear film metrics so we are just trying to say here that your dry eye of today is not like dry eye of before everything has changed and it's 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 like now it's become a global epidemic it's become a global pandemic now we can say dry eye every second person has is coming with one of the symptoms computer usage has increased now the most uh, difficult uh, most challenging part for us is going to be like children also have schooling on your uh, on your digital screens like they have to be on their ipads or computers or desktops because your schooling is from uh, at home so all this is going to increase and you know we have to have new approaches in this dry eye pandemic uh, in this new normal for this dry eye pandemic as well and we can't just rely on our conventional treatments for this new patients uh first let me just say about uh, diagnostics how I, we can diagnose this mevobian gland dysfunction i would say it's not just any mevobian gland dysfunction anymore but it's an ocular surface distress which is happening which leads to all these symptoms and we have to target on this now and rather than just mgd so uh, just to explain a basic of nerves how do nerves affect professor uh, anand geller et al has recently said that the newer uh, like the Uh, the modern era dry eye is not just your mevobian glands or your tear film it is related to your nerve function and if we can normalize this nerve function or if we can take care of this nerves your dry eye symptomatology and everything will improve uh so let's see like how this is how your normal nerves look like they are healthy like they are well spread and like you know the, the bunch is good but if you see here these are all the unhealthy nerves which you see in dry eye here you can not see like a good density of nerves the density is reduced there are a lot of dendritic cells the cells which you you, are, you see here are the dendritic cells now dendritic cells are nothing but some cells lying in near the limbus but in case of any inflammation they just get activated and they come to the center of your uh, limbus and then they give you symptoms like uh, pain without stain your neuropathic pain or your nociception so all these dendritic cells are uh, the ones which gives rise to patient symptoms and mature ones are more worse than the immature dendritic cells and microneuroma are also something like which you see in dry eye patients which are associated with a lot of pain uh so how does it correlate to our practice now whenever the nerves are healthy patients will osds score osds score is nothing but your dry eye questionnaire which gives you a idea about the uh, how bad the patient symptoms are so if there are the nerves are healthy the osds scoring is going to be normal and patients are not going to have much of symptoms or nil symptoms but if your patient's nerves are unhealthy if there are a lot of dendritic cells present the patients are going to have a lot of uh discomfort which you can get with an osds scoring which is a freely available questionnaire on google and these are the patients high osdi means high symptoms so osdi scoring is an indirect measure of how your nerve health is and this is just higher the osdi scoring higher the inflammation and higher the dry eye disease 
now how do we correlate you know how does it like do you know whether you are seeing your dendritic cells are telling you the truth or not what we did was we just correlated it with our uh, tier biomarkers now tier in tier biomarkers you see multiple type of cells but the predominant ones are the pro nociceptive and then in the anti nociceptive pro nociceptive are the ones which give rise to pain and the anti nociceptives are the ones which prevent pain Now, if you see in patients who don't have any dry disease, you hardly see any markers present. Like your pro nociceptive and anti nociceptive factors are in balance, but in dry disease, there is a high imbalance of this pro nociceptive, like this pain markers and the markers which control pain. So the the markers which lead to pain are much higher, which are seen in this dry disease than the other are. And what happens is when these markers are very high. in your meibomian gland dysfunction there are like you know there are obstruction or a uh, hyposecretion of this mark uh, this tear or uh, lipid layer uh, which leads to tear film instability which leads to your which makes your ocular surface under stress there is a lot of desiccation and hyperosmotic stress present on your surface which leads to a lot of uh, abnormal cytokine and chemokine production and that is why all your patients have abnormal inflammation and nociception so in 60% of the patients which you are going to see in your practice are going to be the ones which you can treat with a conventional treatment but there are now 40 to 50% of patients which present with lot of discomfort nociception which is pain inflammation discomfort burning sensation which are not going to be uh, like you no know, benefited with your conventional treatment so these are the arm of patients which you need to really look upon why is this happening the third is bio biochemical markers like you know you always even though you treat your patients with your whatever therapeutics or dry newer their dry therapies you also have to keep the vitamin d and b12 in check now if you my guys might be wondering like you know vitamin d is not something you know half of the indian population will have it less yes agreed half of your population is going to have vitamin d or b12 less but it is again correlated with a higher discomfort scoring and more inflammation and if you don't treat this low vitamin d or b12 levels then you whatever treatment you do you give drops or you do one of your dry therapies the patients are not going to respond well to the treatment and you know these are going to be a refractory dry disease cases so along with treating them it's also important to take care of d and b12 and now we all know that vitamin d is very nicely correlated with your cytokine storm in uh, covid as well so you know it's not just a small thing it's a very important factor which you should see in your clinics as well the second thing like you know uh, we don't know or a lot of us have seen is like a lot of patients come in our clinic when they you know complain of lot of burning sensation itching and all that and doctors nowadays are facing all that all like my i myself have started having all this burning sensation dryness complaints more why is that happening it is probably because of the mask why because of mask is because it's going to uh, come here your breath is coming towards your eye there is an altered respiratory parameters whenever you have an altered respiratory parameters there is an enhanced evaporation of tear film uh, which leads to dryness or inflammation which leads to a lot of stress on your uh, eye and which will lead to discomfort pain disease progression and altered you know even if you do your cataract surgery or tract surgery in this kind of patients there are going to be an altered surgical outcomes now this is how your normal cell looks like but when you wear a mask when you have any of such abnormality or hyperosmolarity present here these are all your golgi bodies which normally seen your eye you see here there is there, there is no cells present here there is hardly any golgi bodies or anything present here so this are how dead your hyperosmolar uh you know cells or the surface looks like so it's very important for us to treat these patients with mask also and you know have give them a healthy surface so this is i'm just going to skip this because it's just the uh schematic of how the mask wearing can help your surgical outcomes or uh, can affect your dryness so now let me come to you know in today's era if you treat this patients with refractive surgery what will happen now there are patients who walk, walk in your clinic uh difficulty in ac environments or they have a lot of contact lens intolerance their osdi scoring is high what if you go ahead and do a refractive surgery now this is the patient one with no complaints this is a patient with two with lot of complaints this are how uh, how healthy the nerves are and this are how unhealthy the nerves are and these are the molecular markers which i have discussed previously now if i operate on this patient any surgery like lasik prk or smile uh i'm not just saying this based on some hypothesis a lot of work is been done uh, in my phd which i defended last year post operatively the if the inflammation is higher the the healing is going to be all the way altered 
this is how your normal healing is this is before surgery when you do a surgery your nerves at 3 and 6 months are healthy however if there is a lot of inflammation present pre operatively your nerves are like this post operatively they are going to be even worse the healing is going to be abnormal and clinically what you'll see in the patient is this one patient which have no complaints before surgery are going to have a normal healing but this is the patient with healthy uh, like you no know, lot of complaints like discomfort contact lens intolerance or not comfortable with mask or after wearing mask the complaints have increased they're going to have like dlk kind of a picture on day 1 or one week uh, abnormal healing of the nerves which will have a lot of epithelial irregularities post surgery which will lead to an abnormal quality of vision the quality of vision post surgery is going to be very bad and these are the patients who are going to be unhappy and going to bother you a lot and long term in prk you can have haze in lasik you have ecclesia and smile also you can have ecclesia if you treat on this kind of patients and how does it impact your cataract surgeries everything normal uh, fundus is normal or uh, your cataract is normal grading your topography is normal your epithelial maps are normal your tear film matrix your dry eye evaluation is normal based on all this you go, go ahead and try to do a multifocal eye for the patient uh post operatively a well centered eye well but however the patient complains of a lot of post operative glare now what is the missing link here what is happening here like why is the patient having a lot of glare in spite of having everything normal so if you see here these are the two patients patient one with no complaints patient two with a lot of persistent glare with a well centered eye well uh and a poor vision break up time if you see here this is just a uh, representative image of this patient having a lot of poor ocular surface uh digging deeper this patient has a lot of abnormal nerves compared to the patient who doesn't have complaints and post operatively the patient landed up because of the inflammation because of the unhealthy surface which was not seen with your normal tear film matrix the patient landed up in an epithelial hypertrophy whereas the other patient is normal and that's why the patient has abnormal vision so just to conclude this a normal healing and impact on his outcomes are going to be like a normal healthy surface but if your surface is abnormal and if you do a cataract or a refractive surgery post operatively your patients are going to have abnormal vision or uh, abnormal uh, a lot of glare and other complaints and because their epithelial maps are abnormal and because they have unhealthy nerves post surgery so how do we manage this patients because all these patients who are going to walk into your clinic for either a cataract surgery or refractive surgery they don't want to wait for your conventional treatments they don't want to wait and you know 6 weeks you put them on hot fermentation you give them an occupolty and steroid drop or a steroid ointment and a lubricating drop they want some quick therapy and if you don't do it they are going to go some to some uh, other doctor and get it treated so you're going to lose your patient so how do we manage them there are a lot of like you know what you can do is there are a lot of newer diagnostics the main area of our discussion today you have new new kids on the block like lippy flow ei i light yeah and i i like being the ipl uh, structures so how do we utilize this apart from our dry eye practice like you can utilize this for our dry eye practice as well but also for your cataract and refractive surgery patients so what happens is we did a study on evaporative dry eye surgery patients where we did all this before surgery uh we also collected the tears just for our interest to see what is happening before and after eye light procedure and we did an eye light for them uh we took various grades of patients with uh, various grades of mgd uh and women gland loss and we did an uh eye light procedure on them this was the uh inclusion criteria a uh, high osdi any symptomatic patient or women glass drop out of less than 50% mild to moderate mgd or t but less than 5 seconds uh and the exclusion criteria was yes aqueous deficient dry eye or any systemic illness we did exclude them from this study however we do it for our routine patients not for this study but yes we do give them a benefit of having this treatment uh with extremely guarded prognosis saying that you might benefit it with and you know your tear function might a little bit be normal so what we observed was post uh, i light Uh, when symptoms were uh, much better like schomers were almost similar but there was a significant improvement in tbud and the discomfort which was noted by the osdi scoring significantly reduced uh, post your eye light treatment and not going to go in depth of it but these are all the inflammatory molecules which were analyzed for this patients through your tears or
all this uh, inflammatory molecules uh, which were there on your ocular surface suggesting that yes this treatments act much better now a lot of people keep on asking us that you know there are a lot of treatments uh, which treatment is the best uh, which is a better treatment or which is not a better treatment so what we did was we took three arms like uh, touch would we have uh, we did a comparative study with lipti flow and ei also ei has a similar principle like eyelight but yes ei doesn't have a mask on it eyelight has a benefit that it has a mask associated with it so what how does mask help you i think dr anaga and dr saurabh will uh, uh, cover that part uh, i'm not going to go much into depth but mask uh, it li recent literature has been showing that it shows 50 to 60% of improvement in your mild to moderate diseases if it's a moderate or high grade of mgds you need both the mask and the uh, this thing but if it's a mild or moderate disease you can uh, give a benefit of just the mask to your patients and we evaluated all these parameters before and after the procedure and what we found and we just saw that uh, in symptoms improvement in t bud symptoms and the meibomian gland functions were more so and this is what your uh, ideal treatment would be the discomfort becoming less and your improvement in tear film stability what we found was that uh, lipi flow has been there for like more than 10 years now however eyelight had equally good results like eyelight and ei but had equally good results in terms of your t bud and your discomfort like your other procedure so it 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 behaved equally well uh we just don't use this treatment for our uh, dry eye patients as i mentioned we do a lot of this eyelight therapies for our patients before cataract surgery because as i said with mgd uh today's uh, newer generation patients don't like to wait so we do do it prior to cataract surgery or refractive surgery or even for our keratoconus patients who have a lot of inflammation we do it a week before and we plan their surgery after a week so that safety period is there even if the patients are contact lens intolerant don't have any significant mgd we give one of this treatments to the patient your glaucoma patients are intolerant to their medications you know like they have a lot of preservatives in the medication and that to do the comply and they have a lot of this discomfort and all you can also give one of this therapies uh, like you know this i like to your glaucoma patients with explained prognosis because that like you know their ocular surface health improves Yeah, their discomfort reduces, and that's why they have more compliance to their drops, and their lifestyle becomes much better. And as mentioned before, aqueous deposition dry eye—it's uh, a relative contraindication. I would not say it's an absolute contraindication. It's a relative contraindication because you can always say these patients—they have some amount of gland problem also, and we know that this therapy helps in improvement of your gland morphology and the structure. So you can do it with an explained prognosis, saying them that you know this will help you and make you feel better, uh, just to improve your compliance to the light. So the this. eye light or an ipl therapy is not just it's restricted you to your meibomian gland dysfunction these are wide varieties which we have tried in our clinic which we routinely do in our clinics for our patients and then take them up for surgery or give them a better lifestyle post surgery so how do we judge so this is what we do uh, yes all your patients are not going to respond to the treatment so how do we judge the outcomes there are first group of patients who are going to improve both symptomatically and your metrics are going to improve uh, there are three settings however a uh, lot of patient people ask us can we do a repeat treatment yes you can do a re repeat treatment after 6 months if the patients uh, are doing good and if they responded with the first treatment uh, there are set of patients going to be like you know you feel that your tear film metrics are t but osd everything has improved but patient says that you know i don't feel anything i feel the same uh this are only like 10% of the patients because 80% of your patients i like in our practice improve with first sitting also however we tell them to take all three sittings they improve with the first sitting but 10% are going to say it's not improved it just means they have a lot of inflammation in their eyes keep them on medical treatment and if there is no improvement you can repeat a treatment again there is no inhibition it's, this doesn't lead to any side effect so you can yes you can repeat the treatment sometimes we as doctors are under confusion because patient says that they are feeling very good but we don't see any difference in our t but or any values you are also just keep them on anti inflammatory drops and be at ease going to improve eventually and you're not going to uh, have have an unhappy patients after one or two months on your practice and here also you can repeat a treatment in 6 months only cases there are patients where there are going to be no changes in symptoms or metrics so here you will have a like you know there's you you 
you you would probably avoid a repeat treatment here because they are still going to be unhappy and then they'll come and binge you that give me my money back this didn't work and all that other reason so these are the patients where you just keep them on conventional treatment and don't repeat a treatment so uh, to conclude patient selection is paramount of importance symptoms are as important as signs it's dry eyes is not just about signs like tear fin metrics you have to concentrate on your symptoms as well patients can feel symptomatically better even without corresponding change in signs and it has a very promising role in pre refractive surgery and cataract surgery patients which and other applications like glaucoma and uh, your contact lens intolerance patients and now patients with mask i just didn't add this because of the time but yes a lot of patients who are wearing mask and have a lot of complaints related to uh, you know because of mask i have a lot of uneasiness have a lot of dryness you can try the one of these therapies for that also i would like to thank my entire team obviously led by professor shetty for helping uh, us with a lot of this work and all the technologies and thank you Uh, thank you dr pooja it was a very interesting uh, presentation i think you covered uh, the entire uh, scientific part of it and uh, maybe uh, for a new practitioner it has given a good perspective as to how he can actually incorporate it into the practice uh, i would like to welcome uh, dr anaga now to give her perspective of using uh, this technology and uh, her way of handling uh, dry eye in a larger city perspective and uh, over to dr anaga Thank you so, so much. questions can actually uh, there are two ways. One is you can type by your question in the question answer section, so we can answer it, and or you can also raise your hand. So once all the speakers finish up, we can uh, let you ask the question. So right now you can uh, actually type the questions in the question answer chat box, and we'll be uh, going through them and answering them at the end. Uh, dr anaga please yes sir. yeah thank you so much dr senthil for uh, giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts uh, am i audible and uh, is the screen visible yeah yeah you are audible yeah yeah uh, first of all uh, dr pooja has done an excellent job and she has really shown us how scientifically uh, there are so many problems and inflammatory markers and being from an institution they have access to all this and we are really happy that they are doing so much extensive work in that uh, we as private practitioners will have definitely a different perspective more of clinical because we don't have that much access to research like them so coming to basically our perspective this was last year uh, the headlines which read india on the brink of a dry eye disease epidemic and this was a study that was undertaken across 200 locations pan india and what it said was the prevalence of dry eye disease will be about 40% in the urban population by 2030 so i would say why 2030 even today especially because of the covid pandemic definitely there has been an explosion in dry eye uh, problems this was another study that was done by dr jeevan titial et al and they found that very uh, interestingly if you see the age group here mentioned is 21 to 40 years and they found that the prevalence of dry eye disease was as high as 32% and here the main risk factors was the um, exposure to digital technology smoking and contact lens use now in all these years in our residency and in our early years of practice what we have been really of our opinion is that the usual dry eye patient is the post menopausal female having the either diabetes or thyroid or under lot of medications but that is not really how it is today today you will have dry eye disease patients presenting to you with various kinds of symptoms so they may have been treated by practitioners uh, uh, elsewhere and they would come to you for a second third fourth opinions and these are all patients who are probably not exactly diagnosed early and not in time so they will be uh, probably already using some kind of lubricants and they move from one doctor to the other each person probably just changes the brand and then some one fine day the patient really feels that what's really happening because nothing is working so these are patients who need actually our compassion and they had need uh, actual real treatments which today is available to us so we need to move beyond just lubricants and like dr pooja said even in our practice it is the cataract surgery patients and the refractive surgery patients whom we actually uh, uh, because they are the premium patients whom we also have to look at rather than just the patient who is walking into your clinic 
uh, in fact there was this paco study that was done in the cataract surgery patients where pre operatively when they evaluated a lot of these patients even though only 13 patients 13 percent patients actually complained about symptoms almost around 60 to 70 percent of patients actually showed signs especially like central staining or a low t but so how many of us are actually doing a dry eye workup in our cataract surgery patients giving them ipl comes only when you actually diagnose them pre op so in our setup all these cataract surgery patients especially the premium myo like the torix and the multifocals we also do a dry eye workup so that we know beforehand what is the condition of the ocular surface a lot of these patients could be 66 and 6 and still keep coming back to you with uh, complaints of pricking and even with a very perfect and uneventful surgery they can be re really unhappy and like she said yes all the glaucoma patients also are at higher risk of dry eye and in children it has been found more than 40% of children and teens in a recent study had evidence of meibomian gland atrophy so a lot of these patients today in our practice also we are advising them dry eye workup and then they are found to be having meibomian gland dysfunction post lockdown if you see ophthalmology at that point of time practice dropped by 81% cataract surgery dropped by 97% but what increased 300% was the use of digital technology and the amount of dry eye disease and yes among all these patients so these are one subset of patients which we need to focus on because you are giving all their a uh, post operative uh, Uh, the uh, healing and the recovery is going to be basically based on their ocular surface so a patient who is coming to you even if he is in the younger age groups they have a risk factor of exposure to digital technology smoking or allergens environmental stresses changes in humidity and temperature and if they are been on medications especially females on oral contraceptives or anti hypertensives diabetics patients of thyroid disorders and so on so if we are now today focusing on meibomian gland dysfunction a little bit on the pathophysiology it is basically the hyperkeratinization of the meibomian ductal system and the increased viscosity of meibom which causes the obstruction of the meibomian gland so here you basically have this uh, duct which is obstructed and that causes the dilatation of the central ductule and an acinar atrophy so this is basically the meibomian gland dysfunction so how do you check it this is the me check that you have along with the uh, machine or any mybography you can do even on the auto refractometer even though you may not have a print out but at least you will have an idea so it is basically graded as 0 to 25% loss or a 26 to 50% area of loss grade 2 will be 51 to 75% and grade 3 would be more than 75% area of loss so what you would look at is this is the gland structure so these are these vertical glands meibomian glands that are seen on the upper lid and lower lid the lower lid is a little more easier to perform the upper lid you need to evert but you need to teach your optometrist or technician and once they get the hang of it it's really very easy so ideally we need to do both so these are the shortened glands or you can have areas of uh, gland loss like this or meibomian gland uh, uh, atrophy but you also need to correlate it with all these clinical features you need to compress and see whether there is good expression of meibom whether it is thick or toothpaste like if there is any foaminess along the lid margins or any lid margin telangiectasia in all these patients remember that they may or may not be symptomatic like dr puja was mentioning the asymptomatic patients may be twice as common as the symptomatic patients so what we do in our clinic is usually we give an osdi or a speed kind of a questionnaire to the patients in the opd and by the time they come to the optometrist or to the consultant we already have an idea about what is their symptomatology irrespective of uh, their age irrespective of their profession and irrespective of what they have actually come to us for so you basically know that a lot of these patients have symptoms and at the same time if you feel that they have a lot of risk factors even without symptoms when you go ahead and do their signs a lot of these patients could have signs of say low t but or meibomian gland dysfunction so what we basically do is the osdi score the that is the subjective evaluation so uh, the schermer's test the t but and the meibography and as we all know if it is 0 to 12 then it is normal higher the osdi score that means the patient is more symptomatic and the patient uh, needs to be definitely put on treatment 
and that is also important because you would like to monitor these patients post uh, IPL treatment how much the OSDI score has reduced. So you continue with medical treatments, you give them warm, warm compresses and so on, but definitely they need something more. So apart from the routine medical treatment, we are today giving them these kinds of treatments. And what is important in these treatments is they need to be cost effective. They need to be affordable to the masses. You cannot have something which is so uh, expensive that the patients would not want to go in. There are some treatments which are, which are as expensive as a cataract surgery done in some of the peripheral areas. So definitely you cannot advise them. They would say that after this, so I will cataract surgery. Nahi karungi. So coming to the principle and the mechanism of action. So I would be speaking basically on how this works. So there are two ways. One is the direct treatment. One is the indirect treatment. So basically, since inflammation is one of the most important pathophysiology in dry eye and the myobiome becomes thicker, these either the thermal pulsation or the, uh, these treatments act by photobiomodulation and they have a dual advantage. They not only help to unclog the glands, but they also treat the inflammation. So basically they act as an anti-inflammatory agent. So this is the mask that you get, okay? And you put it on the patient's face. There is an LED matrix light and this helps uh, that wavelength activates the mitochondria and triggers the cell ATP production. And then you can just put a little gel. So basically you don't, it is an absolutely simple treatment and the optometrist or the technician is instructed and advised how to do it and they can manage it very easily. It takes around 15 minutes, absolutely non-invasive, no anesthesia required. So what it does is basically it's not just external heat. It's not just a warm compressors that you're doing. It's basically increase of the endogenous heat. It helps in both the upper lid as well as in the lower lid. The eyes are kept closed when it is put on the patient's face and then you can disinfect it, especially in the COVID era, you need to disinfect. So because of the increase in the endogenous heat that penetrates through the meibomian gland, it also liquefies the fat and then you also along with it, you do the compression and then you do the mybo expression. So that helps in the treatment. Then coming to the second part of the treatment, which is the intense pulse light therapy or the OPE. So that is the area that you are using. You put a protective shield on the patient's face. Here again, no anesthesia is required. No gel is required. In certain other machines, gel is required. Here there is no gel required. So there are these bursts of light which just take around two to five minutes. So how do you decide on the power required? Basically, you go on to the MGD and the amount of pigmentation or skin pigmentation of the patient. The treatment surface is around 12 centimeters square and there are these five areas where you actually give these flashes. So these are on the periorbital areas and on the cheekbones. Now, what, how this works is basically these are pulsed lights. So there are these telangiectatic vessels along the lid margin. So the chromophores in the hemoglobin are capture this uh, pulse light okay. and these telangiectatic vessels are closed down. The pro-inflammatory cytokines are reduced, the bacterial load is reduced and they also help to stimulate the neurotransmitters. So all this helps to improve the lipid flow. So the lipid layer of the tear film basically increases, which is the basic problem in the evaporative dry eye disease. So you help to improve the t -butt. So usually what we say is there are three settings required at 15, 30 and 45 days. But in our practice, we go step by step. So there are many patients who are so happy by the first sitting, they say we would now want to wait. So with time, we have realized that sometimes we tell them, okay, let's see after the first sitting. If you are not feeling better at all, then definitely we go in for the second and third. Now, sometimes these patients come back after six months or one year with these problems which are recurrent and if this happens, then we need to repeat the treatment. Side effects are really very, very uncommon. At the most, you may have some kind of redness, tenderness, especially in dark skin patients. And yes, it is definitely cost effective, especially compared to lipid flow and of, uh, some of our colleagues who are using, we know that there definitely patients are not really very comfortable paying up so much. And a very few contraindications like pregnancy and photosensitivity, or if there's any active eye infection. Now, what is important is a lot of literature have shown what are the changes that occur after this. How would you monitor them? So for example, in this uh, study, which was in 2016, what they found was the subjective OSDI scoring was better. And they found that this was a very safe procedure. And here the patients underwent four IPL sessions. So each of these studies have different uh, number of sessions that they gave to the patient. 
now this was another study which showed statistically significantly reduced symptoms so this is not only symptoms but also the metrics like what dr puja was saying so this was another study this was done in 2018 which was a multi center study of ipl in refractory myobian gland dysfunction so what they found was the mybum grade the lid margin abnormality scores the breakup time and the conjunctival fluorescence stain all of this improved along with the symptoms so all this is important both the symptoms as well as the signs this is another study which again showed how the myobian gland secretion quality expressibility along with the symptoms improved now this was our own data actually this is a 6 months old data there are patients added after that but we have not yet updated on this so here if you see around uh, we did around more than 500 plus eyes and more, almost 80% patients showed improvement so now when we explain to the patient we tell them that there would be around 10 to 20% of patients who may not improve but that doesn't mean that you should not take the treatment definitely 54% of patients showed more than 50% improvement which is very very high and remember that this was just one week after the first sitting one week after the first sitting now we called the patient again one month after the first sitting and here we found 71% showed improvement and out of that almost 68% showed more than 40% improvement so you know after the first sitting when the patients are so happy a few of them would say that we don't want to go in for the second and third if at all we feel that there is a resurgence of symptoms we'll come back to you how else did we monitor we also checked their tbud their osdi score and their myography so like for example this was a young patient 37 year old he showed 50% improvement in symptoms okay but if you see the pre ipl and post ipl tbud the tbud improved from 2 to 8 seconds and the other eye also 3 to 8 seconds and very minimal change in the myography this was another patient a 69 year old female 60% improvement in symptoms and if you see the tbud in one eye it uh, changed improved from 5 to 8 in the other eye it didn't so which only was to say that symptoms and signs either one of them may improve or both may improve so it is not necessary that everybody would respond in the similar fashion now some of these patients also gave us very good feedback which i would like to share with you now for example if you see these are some of the google reviews that they gave two months suffering from dry eye have taken ipl treatment having better results this other patient has said pricking itching problem now for example a patient coming with itching now unless there is a gross allergic conjunctivitis you know that many times dryness can present as itching so these patients need to be also looked at from a dry eye perspective so this was a patient whose uh, problems and uh, pro uh, itching and symptoms reduced now these are other patients 80% positive results within a month another patient who said 60% improvement within a week and not feeling any of the difficulties vision also has improved in fact i remember there was a multifocal eye well patient whom we had done a dry eye workup pre op and post operatively vision was 66 and 6 within one week he came back to me and said vision has dropped we saw the vision 66 and 6 everything was normal and then since we knew that the ocular surface was not really good he had refused treatment pre op we gave them an ipl we gave him an ipl treatment at that point of time and within a weeks time he improved so then this is another patient 50% improvement so basically all these patients have shown improvements in most of their uh, most of the cases at least in 80% which is a very significant uh, figure so this is some other results also and here they have given four treatments uh, one to four treatments four to six uh, weeks apart and speed two so you can have different kinds of questionnaire also there were few studies where patients who have not shown improvement with lipiflow have been given ipl treatment and it has shown improvement again if you see if there are any changes or improvement in the myobian glands uh, myography post ipl so these are microscopic changes so they may or may not show uh, changes but some studies have shown that these are the stem cells earlier they could not enter the acni but now after the treatment because we can penetrate the acni probably regeneration of the myobian gland could occur but this is something which we will need to uh, see more in detail so we need to explore whether there is a possibility of reversibility of myobian gland atrophy and how long it will take so to conclude this treatment definitely has very good efficacy showing great results 
and it is a new modality and definitely something more that we can offer to all our patients in whom till date only lubricants was what we had to offer and even in our uh, setup we have found that aqueous deficiency patients really don't really respond so much so i have stopped actually uh, promoting it for the aqueous deficiency patients otherwise it works really great so this technology is really put mgd management on the fast track thank you so much for your kind attention thank you yeah uh, presentation uh, i think the dry eye is a very common problem which is uh, seen even by a smaller practitioner so basically uh, uh, your presentation showed how it can be actually applied and it was quite interesting because it is new for me also uh, first time i'm seeing how this treatment is being done Uh, now I'd like to call uh, Dr. Saurav Patwarzan to uh, a good friend to uh, talk about his experience of this treatment in a smaller town, uh, maybe a tier two kind of a town. How he has applied uh, this treatment in his practice, and then uh, over to Dr. Saurav Patwarzan. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Senthil, for the opportunity to speak, and uh, I'll be sharing. And most of the basics are already covered, so I will just uh, focus on. uh my experience with this uh, technology yeah uh, so i work not in tier 2 but it's a tier 3 city uh, but it doesn't matter because all patients are precious and uh, we need to use the best technology which is available to us and uh, i will not go through the basics because it it has been already covered and what's important now as already mentioned by dr anuga ma'am is that now we don't have a typical age group of uh, dry eye patients it starts right from the young age as uh, students also and uh, i was surprised to see so many uh, mgd patients uh, between age group of 12 to 15 with the online classes and exams they are nowadays giving and lot of time they are spending uh, in younger uh, generation also between 20 to 40 also they are spending a lot of time on this uh watching uh, various movies and videos on the your uh, channels so uh, again it has shifted from television to your mobile screen so it has increased the dryness and dryness related symptoms a lot and this is what normally happens when they come to a particular practitioner we know that the patient is suffering from this dry eyes and we start uh, giving them one drop first and then we keep on adding them because the patients are not satisfied and they will keep coming back and every time they come to a ophthalmologist we ask them to put another drop but what is the patient's perspective about this treatment we feel as ophthalmologists that we are treating their symptoms and a patient should be happy but then patients are thinking this that why doctor is giving so many drops so they feel that you know doctor not has not understood what actually i you know i am suffering from or what i want to convey so that's the natural you know reaction from the these patients and they then start the shopping doctor shopping from one to another doctor and every doctor will give them same or similar drops ointments and some medicines and generally from the patient's perspective if there are too many medications given by many doctors they feel that it is a failure of the treatment they don't think that it is a difficult disease to treat but it is failure from the doctor's point of view so i think the first step of any successful treatment or when patient starts trusting you is the instant relief that's what i feel so whenever patient comes to you we have to first think how we can give instant relief to the patient from the symptoms the patient is suffering from i think dr pooja has uh, very elaborately discussed about a lot of things which can be used for treatment of dry eye and dr rohit shetty and dr pooja has really worked on this and they have given so many guidelines so not just lubricating drops but we should be aware of using doxycycline vitamin d steroids immunomodulators lubricating drops etc for treating our patient but still there is an unmet need or there is a gap which was there which was for the instant relief and which was provided to me by this eye light now i will just personally uh, you know would like to uh, tell that how i selected this particular treatment modality because i myself suffer from dry eyes a lot and uh, in every conference i used to look for you know any uh, treatment modality which is available for treating this so i had gone to escrs uh, maybe couple of years back and then there was a, this demo of this machine available which provided ipl treatment so uh, i asked him to whether i can get a treatment done there 
uh, as a demo and uh, the person there uh, helped me with the treatment and the very next day i found uh, that uh, the dry eye symptoms were absolutely gone and i was uh, i mean i was really happy with that uh, kind of technology and i almost immediately ordered that irrespective of the price whatever it was so what the same thing i have found in my patients when i started treating them there was immediate symptomatic relief in 80% of the patients and uh, in terms of medications i think all patients who receive this uh, treatment they have reduced frequency of medications and almost 30% of my patients are now off the medication after treatment and it's it has lot to do because for example if you yourself is a patient and you are asked to put uh, lubricating drops say four or five times in a day you will find that you put it hardly once or twice in a day so obviously if they require less amount of medication it is going to help their ocular surface as well and this has been already covered how does ipl work and it definitely works well so i would like to just uh put some points like how i use i like treatment myself so one moment okay so i use the eye light and my mask in every treatment so i don't use the eye mask and the eye light or the ipl and uh, eye mask separately uh and as per the meboscopic grading this was given to me when i purchased this uh equipment around one and a half years back that for every grade like for example grade 1 2 and 3 uh we have to give sittings every 15 days so for grade 1 there will be only one sitting but for grade 3 there will be three sittings 15 days apart but of course uh, not all patients are very keen on three treatments so generally uh, for non affording patients we can start with the first sitting and then we can continue to observe the patient over next 2 to 3 months and if required we can repeat the treatment now i think one of the most important parts of my treatment is the warm lid compresses which needs to be em emphasized I, i feel that these patient require less repeat treatments if they continue to do the warm lid compresses post treatment steroids is must i use fluoromethylone in 3 2 1 tapered or uh, month so first month they take three month three twice thrice a day and then it is twice a day and once a day but sometimes in some patient you may have to continue it for longer time i think full course of vitamin d that is 60000 units per week for 8 weeks is a must and in case of severe deficiency you can also think of uh, advising patient injectable vitamin d omega 3 supplements including dietary advice like walnuts almonds fish etc has to be told to the to every patient now if the uh, mebon gland disease is active you can see the lid edema there and uh, uh, patient may have inflamed eyelids or Uh, conjunctiva in such cases i always start the patient on full course of oral doxycycline 100 mg bd for 2 weeks and then followed by od for 2 weeks sometimes i repeat this treatment so irrespective of whether you are using this ipl technology or not you have to continue your drug management for these patients to have much better effect and lubricating you can use any drops uh, and uh, you can start off with 3 to 4 times uh, in a day for first month and then you can start tapering as the patient gets less symptoms as far as possible uh, this is i think very important particularly because you are charging the patient uh, for this particular 15 20 minute treatment so we must have a well groomed and well trained technician uh, the patient the technician should be uh, at that time should be uh, informing patient about what the precaution patient, uh, the patient must take also should be attending to patient queries at that time if you keep your very junior technician or you know untrained person sometimes uh, it uh, creates problem because patients feel that uh, they are not being taken care of well though there is nothing much to do for the technician it's very easy job still we should have the best of the business for the there in the clinic then uh, for the pre and post refractive surgery i think what we do here is that we for lower t beauty and abnormal meboscopy we perform one session of eye light and eye mask uh, generally around a week before the procedure but if shermer is too low then in case i uh, do not go for this treatment directly but i start with cyclosporine and medical management for 2 to 3 months and then i check for the improvement and then if required i again repeat the ipl treatment patient is always inform about need of repeat treatment after refractive surgery in those patients who have got pre operative dry eyes 
post smile none of the patients so far required treatment but post lasik i treat this patient after 3 months if the patient is symptomatic for dry eyes uh in case of pre op cataract i think uh, this is something different from dr anagha ma'am that i do not test for dry eyes uh, in uh, all patients of cataract surgery because uh, you can see that uh, in meboscopy many patients will have some grade of meibomian gland dysfunction but not all patients have symptoms post operatively so we generally inform the patient but we uh, test or we treat them only post operatively if there is uh, symptoms associated with uh, mgd post operatively of course for premium il patient you can look more closely and do the meboscopy done now in our clinic meboscopy is free of charge so we don't charge uh, and even optometrists can order for meboscopy and that's i think good protocol to have particularly those who are in the tier 2 tier 3 cities uh, where they have good volume of patient but patient may not be affording so and un because unless you diagnose meibomian gland disease it is difficult to tell patients uh, about treatment so i think uh, keeping uh, meboscopy at very low charges or free like we do is a good uh, alternative so what are the secrets of uh, these uh, treatment modalities for dry eye i think one of the most important thing as a clinician is also psychological counseling which many times we miss in the clinic because many of these patients uh, with dry eye they may not have shermers that low but they are suffering from dry eye because of other elements like psychological elements including anxiety and depression they may also have insomnia many of these patients have insomnia and you have to also ask them about it and they can seek a particular specialist opinion also if they are suffering from these problems also discuss Uh, uh with patient about uh, preventive aspect because it, it's not just important to just give them advice about treatment but also how to prevent it further for example i tell them to reduce the use of uh, these mobile smartphones particularly after 7 o'clock that is uh, during night time because i feel that the night time use of these screens are more problematic than day time use and also i tell them that tv is better than uh, mobile so if uh, they can use something like chromecast or something like that uh for their work it's better than using mobile alone and of course dietary uh, supplements and diet should be modified accordingly and i feel that warm lead compresses is one of the very good treatment modalities and daily uh, i advise them to take daily this warm lead compresses it improves i think and requires less treatments later i think there are very uh, less side effects of this treatment but i think it is important to know about the skin type so darker skin individuals uh, you have to be aware about treating them uh, i generally avoid uh, giving this treatment for very dark uh, skin because they may have burns skin burns or blisters and also if they have some certain moles or you know dark areas or patches around the periocular area or on the face what you can do is you can cover it with some kind of sticking or maybe cotton uh during treatment because uh, it might uh, get uh, you, you know absorb more light and can can cause burns or peeling of the skin over that so you have to be careful about these patients also i think aqueous deficient dry if the patient has very severe aqueous deficiency uh, i don't find that this treatment is really very helpful though of course as has been mentioned earlier you can give it as uh, you know trial but i don't find any of these patient improving drastically after the treatment for aqueous deficient it is not a, you know a primary modality of treatment so i think from the financial aspects i think this uh, everyone should be interested in so when i purchase this equipment of uh, eye light and eye mask uh, the cost of equipment approximately was 28 lakhs which included 200 2000 treatment pack packs for the ipl and eye mask so it was around uh, per treatment cost was around 1400 and we kept very low charges of 4500 so it because this is a tier 3 city and not many patients will be affording even this much but of course for tier 2 and tier 1 city you can charge 8000 or maybe more than that uh, 12 to 15000 also for the sitting now for last one and a half years we have done around 1000 treatments uh, of course we do bilateral treatments uh, i don't do generally unilateral treatments so these are 1000 uh, patients or 1000 treatment settings so that's approximately 50 per month you can say and uh, uh, we have revenue of 45 lakh from the machine so i think this is a uh, good uh, uh, return for my investment and also patients are also quite happy with the treatment so that's a little bit from my 
uh, experience. Yeah, thanks. Over yeah. to you, Senthil. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Saurabh. I think uh, you have uh, given me the right lead uh, to continue my presentation because I think now uh, a lot of people are stunned that uh, the cost of the equipment is 28 lakhs. So actually that's not the, uh, so the whole idea of this webinar is not only to have this uh, uh, modality of treatment portrayed, but also to see how we, somebody having a small clinic can also enter into it. Um, maybe that's the whole idea to make it more affordable to the individual practitioner. So definitely it's not going to cost uh, 28 lakhs to start this treatment. Uh, Dr. Saurav, I think has started uh, got this equipment uh, way back. Now it has become very affordable. And, uh, maybe uh, in my last two slides, I will tell you about the special uh, way we have negotiated with the company to make it uh, affordable to as many ophthalmologists as possible. So maybe I will like to cover a little bit for five minutes about uh, this Aftal uh, Practice Development Club, uh, which we have been running. Uh, because overall, uh, there has been a lot of uh, scientific uh, discussions happening, but there is not too many uh, organizations or too many discussions supporting uh, ophthalmologists on individual practice development. So uh, because in India, there are these 6,000, 7,000 smaller eye hospitals, which are run by the ophthalmologists themselves. So there is no managerial uh, post in these hospitals. So the ophthalmologist also has to do a lot of uh, things like HR management, marketing, multiple things, for which he is not trained. And most of the time we don't have the uh, knowledge or education to uh, seek out uh, these managerial uh, exposure. So that is the exact reason why I thought it's important to start uh, uh, organization or a small club which can actually uh, guide ophthalmologists on practice development. And one of the initiatives of this is to uh, procure uh, fancy mobiles or equipments at, as a group and bring it as much as affordable to the ophthalmologist. Uh, like we have a lot of discussions happening about uh, OCT and the best OCT is uh, sold by the company now is almost 36 lakhs. So, I don't see uh, that as affordable for many ophthalmologists when you have an OCT equipment at that high cost. And uh, the most common complaint that most of the ophthalmologists have is, am I working for these equipment companies? Uh, are these equipments giving me these good returns? Uh, or am I having any return out of this equipment? That's the biggest uh, question which most of the ophthalmologists have. Uh, incidentally, two years back, uh, we had a meeting of LASIK uh, in Mumbai, uh, which was about, uh, just to discuss about the business of LASIK, we had almost 100 ophthalmologists uh, who were LASIK users who attended the meeting, and uh, Dr. Anaga and I think Dr. Saurav also was in the meeting. So, uh, it was very surprising to know that out of 100, maybe 85 of the LASIK users are not making revenues out of the LASIK mission. So, they said, a LASIK machine is not giving us the returns, but we are in fact uh, putting the money which we earn out of cataracts into the LASIK equipment. So basically most of these equipments, unless we are calculating the return on the, one thing is I think it has to be affordable, made affordable, and whether it's producing us the financial returns when we invest on these equipments, that is uh, important. So when we, now as ophthalmologists, everybody is uh, trying to see uh, how we can actually reduce the cost of even procurement of equipments and consumables. That was uh, the idea behind starting this buying group. So I thought, why not we all join together to get fair prices, at least uh, because there is this differential pricing and we don't know whether this equipment we have to buy or not. So we thought, let us guide uh, the colleagues on uh, how to, to make uh, uh, informed buying choices and uh, interact with the users who are already using the equipment. So uh, this, so we started this club and so it's a club, uh, basically it's a group of innovative independent ophthalmology practices where we want to help these independent practices to gain knowledge on the managerial side and flourish and go to the next level. So we, uh, I think now lots of our practices are becoming uh, competitive, this huge competition from the non-profits, competition from the corporates. So for a smaller practice has to remain competitive and profitable. And we wanted to ensure that by uh, helping them, by supporting them with services and products. 
So one of the, these are the uh, once you become a member of this OPD club. So these are all the benefits. So you get access to uh, the website where there are practice development resources and blogs on practice development. And we also have these WhatsApp groups where we have almost uh, 2,500 ophthalmologists who discuss a lot of these practice issues day in and day out. And uh, we also conduct the ophthal conferences. And one of the bigger initiative which we are taking now is the bulk purchase support, where we want to support ophthalmologists buying uh, equipment together. Because once we join as a group, it is easier to negotiate uh, fair and better prices as we have negotiated for this uh, particular highlight equipment. So the companies are now uh, willing to support uh, this initiative. So we will have started with Ortali and then uh, uh, the highlight. Tosh Pro has been very supportive uh, of this initiative. So how do you become a member of this club? So we have a website. You just log into our website and uh, uh, you have to, on the right hand corner, there is this user login where you can go. And if you're not at a uh, you have to just fill in the basic details. We also have a trial membership, very low uh, annual membership cost so that uh, we keep uh, running this uh, enterprise. So we need to have some finances. So we have kept a very low annual membership. So these are the sections of the website where you have practice resources, job section, blogs and webinars and uh, uh, all the webinars are now live at YouTube also. And discussion boards, all the discussions which happen in the groups are posted for the future reunion. And main thing we are now doing is the buying group. So these are, once you have signed up, you will get access to the dashboard where you can actually uh, get into all these uh, different parts. So you have the messages, the resources and uh, the discussion board. And so we have different blogs on practice development written by experts uh, like tax auditors and maybe lawyers and even our own ophthalmologists. And uh, we also have access to experts. So if you want an architect or if you want a, a marketing consultant, so we, are, we have also lifted, listed these experts whom you can access. We have also uh, posted a job section where you can actually post the job requirements. Uh, and if, if you're seeking a job, you can also see which are the jobs available. Uh, we also have a webinar uh, section where all the updated list of webinars happening is posted here. And uh, if you, uh, there are resources, uh, I request all of you also to contribute to these resources, like uh, the consent forms or even the examination forms, surgery forms, which can be downloaded by others for you. So somebody wanting to start a clinic, he did not search uh, a lot about uh, the consent forms and what type of surgery forms he has to print, because he can actually have access to those from other doctors who have contributed it. So these are the resources sample and so the buying group you can become a member of the buying group if you want to uh, purchase equipments and now we have started a lot with equipments so this is the dashboard where you can actually go to the bulk purchase uh, center to uh, buy uh, 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 place your buying request and once you are a member of the buying group on the right side you see this code that is going to be the code of it's a unique code given to each user so we are on the other hand negotiating with the companies to give uh, discounts or at least the fair price to all the members of our buying group so once you code this unique code you are definitely going to get a good price so most of our time is spent on uh, negotiating with the company so purchase decisions keep postponing so we are trying to solve the problem of both the company side and the doctor side. It's not only that uh, we are trying to help the doctors, but we are also trying to help the companies because uh, they are also having difficulty in uh, communicating a good offer or a fair price to the doctors. So uh, maybe in this kind of a platform, it is easier for the companies and the doctors to kind of negotiate and get to the correct price uh, of equipments. So uh, what we have done for this highlight equipment, uh, Toshbro and the company has come out with a good offer, uh, basically to make it as much affordable as possible to the ophthalmologist. So uh, basically uh, you can see this yellow part, which is the mask uh, treatment. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Saurabh mentioned that whenever he, when he started, it was 28 lakhs. 
So the total, uh, the IPL the treatment will be costing around 14 lakhs. And then uh, I think for the starters, you don't have to go with the IPL. You can start up with the mask uh, treatment. So which is 6 lakh to 20,000 against the regular price of 9 lakhs, which is offered generally in the market. So, and we have negotiated this price for of the members. The aim is to have as many doctors as possible to have access to this equipment and starting using it in the clinics. And we have also been able to get an EMA option where you can start with the down payment of just 75,000 rupees and then the remaining you pay as a split EMA for 10 months without interest of 55,000. So basically, uh, so I think this is something for all the equipments we have to work with this kind of a model. So where uh, the entry cost is low and the access ha happens to even uh, smaller ophthalmologists. So uh, basically to start this dry treatment, I think uh, this is something affordable and uh, we have been able to negotiate it. Thanks to uh, Highlight and uh, Toshbro also for supporting us with the uh, reduce price of this equipment and uh, making it more and more affordable to the ophthalmologist. So uh, working on, so this price also comes with uh, 500 treatments. So basically we have also worked out how much is the return on the investment because whenever we buy equipment, most of the time we forget to, we do not calculate the return on equip, uh, the investment. Somebody buys a LASIK equipment for say three pros, but he is not able to calculate how much return it is going to give or how many procedures he has to do to make it financially viable for him. So uh, this equipment, if you buy, uh, so it's going to be uh, 500 treatments included in the pack. And if you're able to do 25 uh, acquired antibodies, so the charges are going to be two. One is you will charge for the diagnosis. So we have kept it at a very minimal cost of 200 rupees for each uh, diagnostic. Uh, with the me check, you are going to you're not going to treat everybody, but maybe you are going to put a lot of patients on the diagnosis part. So uh, uh, generally you can even charge up to 500, but we have taken a very low cost of 200 rupees for each diagnostic test. And the treatment charge is 3,500, but even Dr. Saurabh said he is charging around 4,500 in a smaller town. So uh, definitely you can charge 5,000 or 6,000 for a sitting in a larger room. So we have taken the bare minimum of 3,500 rupees per uh, treatment. So uh, the equipment, the first column here shows the equipment cost is 6 lakh 25,000. And we have taken around 10 to 12 patients treated every month. So we have not taken a very large number of patients. So even at 25 patients at the first quarter, and then the number of patients keeps increasing by 35 in the second quarter and then 40 in the third quarter and 45 in the fourth quarter and uh, each patient requiring three treatments in a year. So that's the number we have worked on. So uh, we can see that uh, after paying the, for the equipment, the net revenue uh, someone can generate is 15.51 lakhs. So uh, even at the uh, initial first year period, there is a possibility to earn uh, 9 lakh, making it very financially affordable uh, for the uh, uh, ophthalmologist to also buy this equipment and use. So this kind of a model, I think we should follow not only for uh, this highlight equipment, but even for our OCTs and all these things. So if we join together and then uh, if we are able to analyze each of these equipments uh, economically before we make those investments, uh, definitely I think uh, a lot of our money will not be stuck on equipments which we are not using. And uh, we don't have to keep saying that, oh, I, I'm actually working for the company or am I working for uh, repaying for the equipment loan. So uh, now uh, because of the pandemic, a lot of companies are also willing to support doctors because they everybody wants to do sales now. So uh, we should take uh, uh, this as an advantage and uh, work out uh, this kind of a model. So we are starting with one of these equipments and hopefully uh, we will try to, more companies will support uh, this kind of an initiative and uh, we will be able to get uh, more deals uh, for the doctors uh, out of numbers uh, in the future also. So we'll be also conducting a lot of our events. Uh, we have conducted uh, the often conferences in a very large scale uh, in Chennai uh, in 2018 and in 2019 in Hyderabad. And 
we had a lasik meeting business of lasik meeting in uh, mumbai uh, uh, because of this covid we are not able to conduct the physical meeting but we are hopeful of conducting uh, more uh, these kind of uh, meetings where uh, the technology is also uh, introduced to the doctors and then we are able to uh, work out uh, some good pricing with the companies so uh, it make uh, we make it affordable for the doctors to buy so these are we also provide continuous ongoing support to our members in these ways and if you want to become a member or if you want to uh, uh, support this initiative of this practice development you can log into our website and uh, become a member and if you are interested in placing uh, orders for the through our buying group uh, you can contact uh, uh, mr hari krishnan his number is here and Uh, so he will be able to help you uh, procure uh, the equipment so uh, we are thankful for all the people who attended this webinar uh, so maybe uh, we will have uh, uh, this comes to the end of my presentation and uh, uh, maybe we uh, there are a few questions which we can take and if somebody has uh, uh, questions on any of the presentations Uh, basically you can raise your hand and we will uh, unmute you and uh, make you an uh, uh, answer uh, get answer for the question so uh, the first question is what is the best way to treat uh, dry eyes with goblet cell uh, dysfunctions so maybe i don't i think maybe is telling about the severe dry eye so maybe one of the panelists can take this uh, question what is the best way to treat uh, severe dry eyes with goblet cell dysfunction maybe dr pooja can answer um so our approach here would be different first of all uh, to know the goblet cell dysfunction it is in a very severe uh, kind of a dry eye disease it will be in a aqueous deficient uh, dry eye disease you normally don't see that in a meibomian gland dysfunction so these are the patients uh, where you first have to uh, like you know patient you have it, it, it's a treatment under extremely guarded uh, visual prognosis so a guarded prognosis and uh, you first have to pro probably uh, tell the patient about what they would be expecting you give them intense lubrication you give them uh, cyclosporin and uh, if it is definitely an aqueous deficient uh, dry disease so you have to probably do a punctal plug also here so and uh, this is what we would do so the second i think uh, scleral contact lenses are also a good yeah. choice makes them uh, symptom free at least yeah basically you need to investigate the cause behind it say for example you may have these anti glaucoma medications which are causing goblet cell dysfunction also so whatever is the primary cause that is uh, uh, actually the trigger factor that needs to be looked at so an extensive systemic investigations needs to be done so like everything your immunological work up uh, you have to uh, do your uh, rheumatoid uh, work up as well and lot of times even if the patients don't have the symptoms of joint or, or you have to do, or do your test for jogren's uh, syndrome as well uh, and a lot of times the patients might not have any of the pre existing symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis or jogren's but you still do an evaluation and anything uh, abnormal you treat the patient along with one of uh, these your colleagues and one more thing this ipl treatment if we, in this context ipl treatment will not work in such condition and another thing you have seen and even if you see extreme mgd is like more than 75% uh, meibomian gland atrophy also no kind of treatment whether it's lipiflu or um, ipl may not work so if it is extensive meibomian gland dysfunction also you need to be doing it only with a very guarded prognosis yeah i that's what i completely agree with you but these are the patients who are not going to respond to most of your treatments they are definitely not going to respond to your convent like like conventional treatment like hot fermentation so here what we do is like not all patients but we explain the patients that you know this is an option yeah. we don't know we we cannot assure you that you will improve but this is the option you have 
you get it done at least some uh, you know like because as i said it's not just about opening up your glands like your inflammatory markers also start washing out and once your inflammation come down comes down their compliance of the drops also increases so it's like we tell them that maybe 2 to 5% improvement might be there but uh, this is a you need to tone down their expectations because see, finally the moment they pay up you know they uh, probably expect a lot so once you tone down their expectations then Yeah. these extreme uh, dry eye patients usually sometimes have a lot of expectations since they have already used drops for so many months and years they feel that you are going to have a magic wand and uh, they are going to feel better that frankly i'll tell that we don't even do that with our uh, um, normal mgd patients we yeah, tell them that right. you know there are chances that 30% like this page right. treatment might not work because these are the patients like we have along with sir we have few patients who have a lot of uh because of this issues they have gone into a psychological distress right so even if we do the treatment they are probably not going to respond so we tell them that 30% there are chances that you will still uh, yeah. Yeah. uh need another therapy. dr saurav wanted to ask you one thing i think 30% is what we also found in our study and that is what dr pooja is also saying in your experience also have you found what percentage of patients it doesn't work I uh, yeah i think in our experience around 20% patients uh, but then uh, we are also very choosy about uh, advising them so we are not uh, advising for aqueous deficiency definitely right aqueous deficiency yeah. is definitely so for evaporative dry eyes and particularly the screen related and uh, they improve drastically for right. post menopausal women that's the typical age uh, the, the factors they will have you know they will uh, respond but very slowly so they need uh, medical management uh, along with uh, ipl i think these are yes. the uh, not uh, or i would say slow responders to the treatment yes. and we also tell all our patients that you know even though we are doing this therapy you will require your uh, medical management this is not to take you off medical management but just to uh you know uh, your your drop frequency will reduce so yeah the Do- doctor saurav was mentioning like you know 30% of his patients were off uh, do you all also put them off treatment dr puja off treatment as in for uh, but what we yes. do you stop the lubricants um not for the initial 6 months no because what happens is that it's going to help them in fact we start them sometimes uh, if if it's if, like you know if it's a moderate grade of uh, disease and have a lot of uh, lid problems we start them on steroids also for at least a month in tapering dose so that will help them so the second question is uh, regarding how much do you charge for one session i think dr saurav uh, said that it's 4500 rupees for each session so Uh, maybe uh, if the others want to comment about it you can comment but generally i feel uh, the market rate is like 4500 to 6000 rupees for each session that is what is being charged for the mask treatment and then uh, uh, other thing is uh, for the diagnostic some of them do it for free some of them do it for uh, 200 rupees per diagnostic test and uh, i think some of them charge even 500 rupees and the other question is now will only the mask therapy work so maybe uh, the uh, panelists can answer this question is it okay only if you purchase the mask is it because i spoke with dr vavikar so he said he is only having the mask therapy and most of his patients are very happy so maybe will only the mask therapy work definitely mask is an important part uh, you can start with the mask and what when i bought the machine i bought it completely and uh, like dr saurav said i am also using both the mask as well as the ipl for all the patients but yes mask will affect improve both the upper lid as well as the lower lid but uh, i always of was of the opinion that when we are giving a treatment we might as well give a complete treatment and probably that is one of the reasons why these patients are showing very good improvements even with just one sitting but definitely taking the mask also will give very good results and uh, like dr vavikar is having very good results with his uh, patients uh, at least uh, without any treatment it, uh, if they are not uh, uh, feeling better at all then at least with the mask definitely they will show improvement 
and if they don't show improvement then probably you can add up on the ipl treatment yeah. start up with the mask and then slowly add on we develop our own clientele maybe add the other treatment also apart from the mebomyography is there another are there any other investigations which are being done that's a question or only the mebomyography is enough with the sbm treatment uh, with the sbm technology we can also check the lipid layer thickness and the blink rate whether it is completely uh, blinking or not and the, you have the interferometry so you compare those images with the eight images that you already have on the machine so basically they are all men, uh, there to check whether the lipid layer is right or not you have the non invasive uh, t but also that's a knee but not, not the t but but all this is technician dependent so if you are doing it properly remember even while doing the t but it is important if there is a fan going around or if you know the technique if you put less fluorescein more fluorescein so there are a lot of variables also so whatever diagnostic modality you are using you need to check that and monitor with the same modality even post ipl i think the most important thing is dry eye uh, disease is basically disease of symptoms so if patient has symptoms irrespective of signs uh, we are going to treat the patient so i think uh, of course investigative modalities are there to monitor the patient but if even if the investigation show almost normal parameters and patient is symptomatic i think we can go ahead with the treatment and these investigative modalities are there for monitoring of course if they are showing abnormalities we are definitely going to treat that patient but even without uh, them showing you know significant uh, problems if patient is symptomatic i am going to treat that patient i agree with dr what dr saurabh said because that's why we i said about that osds scoring uh, we do it for all our patients walking in for dry eye because a lot of times our shermers and tbert are normal it can be inter observer variability as well but if the score is above 33 then it is like a sign that uh, yes you can go ahead and do this uh, procedure because that's how it works and nowadays lot of patients that tear film metrics are normal but even if complain that they you know they can't sit for long in air conditioned rooms or if, even if there is a fan going on it's intolerant to them or uh, they can't wear contact lenses they are intolerant not about the fitting but the intolerance to contact lenses so we have congestion or redness to contact lenses we take it as a red flag sign and uh, we advise the treatment actually the reverse question is uh, uh, more important probably if the patient doesn't have any symptoms but is showing signs will you advise him treatment uh yeah that is a tricky question uh i think that time we would do a mebography uh and again see for that i think you probably can do a repeat tear film matrix and keep them on conventional treatment and then call them no, but they are not symptomatic at all so even if you give them lubricant <laughs> they are not going to feel better they are already okay so on top of it if you advise a treatment which costs them 5 to 10000 rupees they'll say why should i do it like for example they my mom for example my mom before we did our cataract surgery we did a dry eye workup and she had almost a 40% my woman gland drop out but she has no symptoms she so is here, hypertensive she is a diabetic she has the risk factors but she is asymptomatic so today if i advise her to put lubricants that also she doesn't want to put because she is not symptomatic if i advise her ipl treatment which costs her 4 to 10000 she will say why should i do it and so I if, I, I, if i tell her your tbert has improved from 3 to 8 she is not going to feel happy about it because it doesn't make any difference to her so, so i completely agree do? yeah yeah so i i think for asymptomatic patient it's best to counsel them about preventive aspects so diet or uh, other activity which can reduce the dryness i think that is the best way because these patients basically have higher threshold for having symptoms so they are less likely to be symptomatic even in future but of course uh, like as you said in premium patient you can tell them that in future you may have trouble so you you know better be prepared and avoid you know uh, go into the preventive aspects for you know in future so you should not suffer yeah so all these cataract surgery and refractive surgery patient the moment they undergo surgery now everything decompensates so there are a few patients who will decompensate and you know become symptomatic later on that is why it is probably prudent to do a workup and keep and then tell them that it's not the surgery 
but it's your ocular surface which has uh, you know decompensated because of the trigger of surgery yeah i think yeah, the refractive, <laughs> refractive surgery patients are quite uh, you know uh, uh, accepting about this treatment because they want to undergo you know the spectacle removal cataract patients i feel they do not accept this treatment that well because yeah. their main problem is with vision and uh, they do not think about all this preventive and all these thing because they are uh, symptomatic for refractive i think because patients agree also more i go ahead with the pre operative treatment and uh, uh, even for refractive procedures also i even in previous patient when i didn't used uh, ipl treatment but i used to diagnose meboscopy not all patients had problems post operatively because many patients uh, who are wearing either contact lenses or even glasses for long time after refractive surgery in fact improve they their dryness symptoms also improve a lot after uh, refractive procedure that has been also my uh, one of the experiences so not all patients who have shown uh, investigations like going wrong will have symptoms later on so of course if those patients are accepting we can go ahead but i feel uh, there is no need if patients are quite asymptomatic particularly in cataract uh, group of patients because at this age actually all patients will have some form of meibom gland dropout so we don't know what is normal for that age group no uh, i feel it is more for us rather than for them to save ourselves to save our skin and they show that we have diagnosed you earlier they'll say uh, didn't you know it earlier like for example you don't do an oct macula and a patient has a macula miller macular hole patient is comes only with 6 12 post op you will say you should have diagnosed earlier that i had a lamellar macular hole so something like that Just yeah so same thing we, we do the test and we explain the patient correct, that correct. is there you probably will need it like if that it would be better you go ahead with it but if you don't want post operatively if you have yeah. symptoms this is the reason so you have your trump card ready to be used anytime yeah because nowadays the consumer code specially like i'm not sure about bombay but bangalore page it patients the, the the crowd is it patients parents also like the children are it so consumer code will take you to court is like very uh, exactly So for that, if this is there. It's your call, doctor. <laughs> doctor Santil, if you don't mind, I'll need to leave. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah thank you, madam. Yeah, uh, so you. the last question is uh, like, what are the diagnostic tests which are included with the equipment? I think uh, they have this MeCheck diagnostic uh, device, and then uh, the um, uh, tablet and the chin rest and the motorized table. All these things are included with the uh, equipment. uh maybe we are running out of time maybe we can open it up to the audience if any of the audience has a question you can just raise your hand and uh, sachin will unmute the, uh, the you and then you can ask the question so are there any questions from the audience part you can just uh, raise your hand I don't see maybe yeah Dr Ravi Matani uh, can just yeah you can uh, yeah Dr Ravi can ask your question Yes so is there something we can give to the patient as a print out you know to sh uh, as show them that they have dry eye like will we get a print out of the break up time and the mybography etc you know so to counsel them for the treatment Dr. Saurav, maybe you can answer that. I think there is a picture. Uh, you can take a print out of the uh, thing. Uh, maybe uh, Dr. Saurav or uh, Dr. Pooja can answer that question, or Shanas can also answer the question. Yes, uh, Dr. Matani, uh, there is a print out. Uh, it comes with the me check, uh, where you monitor, uh, where you check the myobian. Uh, gland efficiency and at the counseling table the print out goes along with uh, the readings and you actually show the color uh, uh, print out to the patient that look this is where your glands are missing so it's a very vivid nice uh, image uh, that you get as a print out if you okay. share your email address uh, we will send it to you okay ma'am i'll put it in the comments yeah i will take it are there any other questions i think dr anand wanted to ask a question but i don't see him online now 
uh, if there are any more questions we can take it up for another maybe two three minutes or else i think we are already uh, a little later on the time we can so is there any question from the audience i see a lot of audience but maybe not too many enthusiasm okay so uh, i would like to thank uh, everybody who attended uh, we had almost 100 plus participants who attended this meeting because though uh, there is now a pandemic of webinars so many webinars happening there is uh, i think one more webinar at 6 o'clock and so people are so busy with the webinars but uh, thanks for all the 100 uh, participants who attended this meeting and i think uh, we uh, we have, we have been able to do justice to the time spent on this. Uh, and if you are interested to know more about uh, the treatments or to get in touch with the panelists, uh, please feel free to do so. And uh, if you are interested to uh, procure the equipment also, uh, kindly let us know and uh, we can see uh, uh, from buying group and uh, we can uh, buy this equipment. Uh, thank you everybody for uh, being here and I hope uh, uh, have a wonderful weekend, uh, maybe without any more webinars and try to spend as much time as, with the family uh, uh, and hopefully we can all meet together because uh, what we are missing is the physical uh, meeting. So we are not able to meet. So we are actually uh, missing out on the physical meetings and then uh, the dinners and uh, fellowships and uh, uh, meeting with the friends. Hopefully. Uh, with the vaccine coming out, I'm sure uh, we will be able to meet uh, uh, in reality soon. Uh, so we will be having more of these uh, series of webinars. I will keep you updated in our WhatsApp groups and uh, feel free to contact me uh, if you have any more uh, requirements or any clarifications in this. And uh, thank you very much for attending. Thanks, everybody. And I'd also like to thank... Uh, uh, the Toast Pro team for being supportive and uh, being able to provide us with uh, uh, good prices and uh, to take uh, making these technologies more and more affordable for the uh, Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody.